so there is this very delightful looking show out at the parish museum and um it is joaquin soroya and esteban vincente um Joaquin Soroya, you may or may not be familiar with his work. He is he was a um, Spanish impressionist, and um, you know, I mean, that's kind of the category that he fits into. Um, he was a a one of the um, at at the time one of the most sought after portrait painters also. Um, and his portraits are a lot more polished. Uh, he, well, I'll, I'll talk more about this later. Um, Esteban Vincente it, um, died in uh, 2001, I believe it is. And, um, and he was um, a member uh, loosely a member of the abstract expressionists. He was the kind of of that age. Um, and so we'll we'll go into some more depth. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little a little outline of what the exhibition is about um, to begin with. Oh Joan, you're still up. I'm still up where? On 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 screen, I can no, see you. No, not on this. No, only on. Oh, not on your end. On oh, your okay. screen, you, you don't see me. Okay. Okay. There we go. All right. Um, the exhibition um, in the light of the garden introduces the works of two Spanish masters in the context of light and color emanating from their gardens, a vibrant source of inspiration for their final creative periods. Joaquin Soroya. Um, 1863 to 1923, he was about 60 when he died, um, designed the garden at his home, now the Soroya Museum in Madrid, between 1909 and 1911, conceiving of it as a reflection of his own creativity and a work of art in itself. Art and nature become one in this private place of inspiration and retreat. For Soroya, as for other artists at the time, the garden was part of the realm of the senses. Uh, almost half a century later in 1964, Esteban Vincente, uh, born in uh, 1903, died, yeah, 2001. Um, he was 97 when he died. Um, and his wife, Harriet, acquired a Dutch colonial style farmhouse in Bridgehampton in New York on Long Island, uh, where he set up his studio for painting in an 18th century barn on the property and cultivated a beautiful garden. Um, in the Light of the Garden is presented in collaboration between the Esteban Vincente um, Contemporary Museum in Segovia and the um, basically the parish museum and supported by the Harriet and Esteban Vincente Foundation. So it's it's really uh, it's a it looks like a really delightful show. I haven't seen it and I really want to. Uh, <laughs> so um, Joaquin Soroya. Um, excelled in painting of portraits, landscapes, um, monumental works of social and historical themes. Um, his most, he's most typically characterized as a representation, as the representation of people, landscapes under the bright sunlight of Spain and the sunlit waters. Um, in the course of his painting career, he went on to produce a broad array of portraits, landscapes, historical works, genre painting, and murals. Uh, his work is often remembered for the bright sunlight, sunlit impressions and innovative spirit that it conveyed to the 19th century gloomy atmosphere of Spain. 
Soroya's paintings are above all conveying a vigorous brushwork and use of vivid color, which helped to make him a leading impressionist in, in the region. Nevertheless, while he mainly is celebrated for his plein air painting featuring seashore and uh, beach scenes, he was also um, good at producing historical works and landscapes and outstanding portraits. Um, Esteban Vincente, born in 2003, um, I mean 20, <laughs> excuse me, in 1903, um, uh, was Spanish born, um, moved to America in 1937, um, oh, 1936, excuse me, um, with, his, with his wife who he met in Paris and they married there. Um, and he moved into a studio on the same floor with Willem de Kooning on 10th Street. Uh, became friends with Jackson Pollock, Mark Rothko, Franz Klein, and the rest of the, the ab abstract expressionist crowd that was hanging out there at that time. Uh, Vincente refined his gestural style of painting and collage to reflect a more reductive approach that employed vibrant color harmonies and contrasts. He saw control and order in his work, rejecting the idea of the unconscious as an artistic guide, a notion embraced by some of his contemporaries among the abstract expressionists. Uh, instead, he carefully structured mature compositions from evocative and dramatic and nuanced, thinly applied layers of pigment and spare collage elements created and defined by light and structure. So, okay, I'm gonna move us on to here. And, and, and this gives you a side-by-side -side of, of, of the two of them. These are details from a couple of their paintings. And, you can see how different they are, and you can see in some ways how similar they are. The brushwork, the kind of the kind of um, respect for how the paint layers um, affect one another, and and how to build up the, that that kind of um, shimmer in in the surface of the painting. Minute. Didn't mean to go that far. Okay, yeah. So I wanted to stop here for a moment and um, let's say. So what we what we have here is is basically um, there's an atmospheric quality to both artists, you know, Vincente's light touch, thin veils of paint evoke rather than describe the landscape. And, and so um, uh, Soroya uses really fat, juicy brushwork. It's, it's, it's vibrant with light, but it's, it's, very thick paint. He 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 used a wet into wet technique. It was very fast, um, but but both of them are really sensitive to their to to what the brush marks are doing and how those things describe the the quality of of the space. For some reason, my my uh, mouse is a little jumpy today. Uh, okay, um, so this is Soroya painting in his garden. And, and this is a view, a photograph from the, uh, the Soroya Museum. 
and and this is on the on the upper left is is one of his paintings of that of that subject matter where he would just kind of move move around the area and and paint these paintings they're they're really kind of mod, modest scale paintings for him he he did very large scale pieces but the 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 pieces that he did in the garden for the most part didn't get much beyond 30 by 40 inches at 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 most Okay, and here is Esteban Vincente in, in his garden in Bridgehampton. Um, and, and you can see how he used his, his sense of, of the garden to, to um, move into his paintings. And they're not literal, though you can see the direct natural forms that he's kind of taking from the garden into his studio. Um, uh, I'm gonna dive into each artist separately to begin with, and I'll, I'll come back to Esteban Vincente later. But for right now, I'm gonna I'm gonna go into Soroya and talk a little bit more about him and his development. Um, uh, um, books kind of embody a joyful spirit in in a lot of their work, though though Soroya definitely had that Spanish um, uh, realist kind of uh, social consciousness in, in many of his works. Um, in, in some ways, Soroya had a, a really charmed life. He, he um, um, studied in Madrid um, and, and basically um, began to work Right away, um, he that there was there was recognition for for his young budding talent. Um, he worked for a photographer, um, who basically he did lighting for and things like that, and and actually was given a space in in the studio to paint. So he continued with that, um, and he met the daughter of the photographer, uh, Clotilda. And Clotilda became his wife. She was 16 when he first met her. And you see uh, mother in, 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 the, in the bed to, to, the, to the left. Actually, that's Clotilda and, and, their, and their first daughter. Um, very subtle painting, very um, nuanced use of these creams and grays. Um, and, and in fact, there, there was um, uh, x-rays taken of this, this piece. And originally she was looking toward the viewer and toward us and he he made the decision to turn her away and turn her toward the toward the child. Interesting. Um, the the painting on the right, um, another Marguerite. The, this was a a very um, notorious story. Um, the woman depicted in 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 the painting was a prostitute who supposedly killed her child. Um, this is a fairly substantial size painting of 51 by 78 inches. And this piece went to Paris and got great critical acclaim. Um, he, was, he was fairly young at that time. I believe he was about 29 when, when this painting was painted. Um, so there's a social conscience 
and consciousness in, in some of Soraya's work at, at that time. Uh, ah. And now, um, this painting, Sewing the Sail, is a really interesting piece, and I'm I'm going to focus in on it a little bit here. Um, it's there's a there's a quality in many of these pieces, like the snapshot. And in fact, there there were um, portable cameras that that came um, into use in, in 1895. And it really changed how artists compose their paintings. You can see it in Degas. You can see the effect of cropping and of, of interesting vantage points for the compositions that, that artists started to really focus in on. And here, this is a, this is a very interesting composition. You know, the, the figures take up maybe a sixth of the entire canvas. So they're not the real focus of, of the painting. In fact, these subtle grays and blues and creams in, in, in this sail are, are more interesting than anything that's going on with the figures. And that dappled light through, through the vegetation and onto the sail are really more the subject of the painting. Again, large scale piece. This is 86 by 119, so it's nearly 10 feet wide um, by seven feet tall. So this is a big piece, substantial. Okay, and my family um, painted in 1901. This is this is the the three children and 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 his wife. And you can see him up in the mirror in the back. Um, and one of the things that 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 I was saying was was he did have a charmed life. I, he was madly in love with his very beautiful wife and very beautiful family. Um, they they did very well financially. He was he was very successful, sought after for portrait portrait work. And again, this is a fairly large piece. It's 72 by 60 inches. Um, very well painted. Ah, and Saroya and Sargent were both friends and competitors, um, uh, both leading portrait painters of of the rich and famous, uh, very sought after. Um, I think. I think uh, by the by the end of the nineteenth uh, century, Sing, John Singer Sargent was pretty tired of, of doing portraits, uh, and Soroya mixed it up. Uh, he was, I would say that that the mixture of of paintings by the sea and paintings of his family, he mixed in with the commissioned portraits and and um, and larger scale um, mural work that he did do. Um, a great influence on almost any painter in in. Spain, who was painting portraits, was Velázquez, and and um, Soraya was was uh, not one to buck that trend. He definitely admired and 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 studied Velázquez and and his approach, but also Rembrandt. There's a there's a depth and richness to the paint. There's a paint quality that that. Um, Soroya used to paint his larger scale canvases with three foot long brushes so he could stand back from his paintings and really see. And that really kept him from getting too hung up in extraneous detail until he really wanted to bring that out. 
Um, so interesting approach. Now, um, Soroya in, in, I think it was 1905, had a show in London and <clears throat> he didn't sell. He didn't sell anything in that show. It was really bizarre. And, and um, it may have had to do with the, the ascendancy of modernism at the time. Um, but one American collector came and saw his work and invited him to America to do a show. And Soroya brought work to America and had, had a huge exhibition in New York City and sold something like 109 paintings out of that show. And his, his work was immediately grabbed by, by museums throughout the country. Um, he, just, he just made a big hit. Uh, and in 19, now this was, this was 1905, 1906 when that happened. And he was, he was um, commissioned to do a portrait of President Taft. Uh, in 1909. Um, one of the things about Soroya is his portraits, he painted very quickly. He, he said, if, if I don't get it within the first two or three hours, it, I'm, I'm not satisfied with the results. Um, I'm going to try and, and zoom in on, on this portrait. And see, you can see the paint quality. You can see how loose and open it actually is in, in his approach to this. Okay. And here is a, paint, a, a, a photograph of Soroya doing the doing the block in drawing for his large scale painting Clotilda. And here's Clotilda on on the left in in the painting. Uh, again, substantial scale piece. It's it's 46 by it's 73 by 46 inches. And and again this was this was exhibited in the salon in 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 Paris and and got rave reviews. Ah, capturing the moment. While he was doing all of these more developed, um, uh, polished studio portraits and all of that, he would continually go back to the sea. And paint, and paint the the um, the swimmers and the people walking on the beach. This is again a portrait of Clotilda and and their two daughters off in the distance. Um, and if you look really closely at what she's holding, I'm going to zoom in. If you look really closely at what she's holding in her hand, it's a camera. So the instamatic was there <laughs> at that time, um, beautifully painted. Again, one of the things that the camera did was liberate artists from having to do that extraneous detail, that kind of um, uh, eyelash painting, I like, to, I, I like to call it, that they, they didn't need to get hung up on detail. It was really more about how the paint went on and the kind of freshness that they could capture in, in these scenes. And Soroya was the king of freshness when it comes to that. He, these are, are really beautifully painted paintings. Okay, and here again is a um, a portrait of his wife Clotilda, with the cropping at the top of the hat. 
um, you can see that that influence of of the camera and 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 how that really affected how the composition was set up. That's Clotilda and and her daughter, and I can't remember what her daughter's name is now, but it'll come back to me. Uh, <laughs> so again, a fairly substantial composition. This is seventy three by seventy two inches. Um, I, I heard in one of the talks that I listened to that Degas came to visit one of uh, Soroya's uh, exhibitions, walked through the exhibition very quietly, studied things, and said nothing, walked out. One might think that there could have been a little jealousy on the part of Degas, or he may have been just taking in how somebody else was using this technique of, of, of capturing the moment in, in, with, a, with a photograph. Um, again, I'm not saying that, that, that Soroya used photographs. He, I, I don't think he did. For the most part, he did a lot of sketches and did a lot of drawings, but the compositional um, uh, elements that, that he got from photography definitely affected how he would set up these compositions. Ah, and this again is um, the nude is his wife, is Clotilda. Now, he didn't call it by her name because this, this, that, be, that would be shocking and letting the cat out of the bag. Um, he did not sell this painting. He kept it, it his whole life. It stayed in his collection. Um, he really painted it for himself. And then on, on, the, on the left, you see this really intimate scene um, you know, after after bathing, um, you know, some some assistance with the dressing gown, and you see how that light pours across their bodies through that through that shuttered window. Beautiful paint handling. The guy is incredible. And, and again, back to the sea. Yeah, and he did, uh, I have seen many, many of these pieces where, where the, the sunlight sort of absorbs these figures. They, they kind of shimmer in that, in that bright sunlight. But again, look at the composition. We have this, this umbrella in the foreground which is a very still point. And then this, this turbulent, shimmering ocean. Really interesting. Um, and now, Vision of Spain, also known as uh, Provinces of Spain, was painted between, it says, 1913, 1919, um, it, it's a series of 14 monumental scale uh, pieces. If you look at the small photograph on, on the left, you can see the size of those two women standing before this, this piece. Now, this was Archie Huntington, who was the collector that saw Soroya's paintings in London and invited him to New York. He, he also um, funded this mural that was really to take 10 years at least to execute. It says, it says 1913 to 1919. I think it's longer than that. I think it was a 10 year period that it took him to execute, to actually execute the painting. It was exhaustive. He went to different areas of Spain and looked at the, the, the costumes, the historic garb 
throughout Spain and tried to integrate all of that into this painting. To tell you the truth, for my taste, I like the sketches at the bottom better than the finished piece, but I haven't seen it. It is installed in the Hispanic Society of New York, in New York City, so it's there. Um, though they are undergoing a massive renovation at this stage of the game, so I don't think we have access to it at the moment. But I definitely want to go and see it at some point when, when it's back open. Um, they have a fabulous collection of Soroyas in, in their collection. But you can see these sketches, these little sketches down, down below. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zoom in a little bit here and just go in here so we can take a look at that. Look at how luscious that little piece is. It's amazing. And I'm going to scroll over and look at this drawing. I've seen Rembrandt drawings that are very similar to this, that gestural quality that he got, and they're they're very lively. I, um, and again, this is another study. You know, you can see the the ship being pulled out to sea, the boat. Okay, so I'm going to move along now. All right. Now we're going to get back to the subject of this of this talk, which is getting to the garden, and we're headed in that direction. This is a nap. Again, his favorite subject, the family, napping out and reading and hanging out, having a siesta, and a fisherwoman by the sea. Ah, and when he was in America, of course, he went to visit... Lewis Comfort Tiffany on Long Island and painted Tiffany in his garden. And now we're back to Elena, one of his, his youngest daughter in, in the garden. And this is the first of the gardens at the Soroya house. And, and these are still accessible, these gardens that the museum is is there and and the gardens are beautifully tended. Yeah, let's see. Okay, here we are. And you can see, you know, the ornate tile work and things like that 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 he put in here. But on on the left, lower left is is one of his paintings of of the garden. And this blossoming tree. So it was a combination of fountains and, and gardens and paths that would really engage him for the last 10 to 20 years of his life, really. And one of the things that's going on here is really subtle use of color, beautifully, beautifully done. You know, the rhythms of the brushwork. Um, it's, it's really very loose and free. Uh, you know, if you, you look at this, you know, it could be, it could be a Van Gogh. I mean, basically, um, it, but there's really subtle things that that you know intuitively come into play here. If you look at that that tree in uh, on the in the um, left third of the painting, and you look at what's going on with it, you look at how it goes from cooler at the top to that warmer red, rusty red, into the green at the bottom. And these complementary, um, muted complementary colors. And then if you look at how it gets darker toward the top, and he brings in those light yellow strokes behind it, and 
the darker strokes in, in the upper area. So there's a dimensionality that's happening just in that little passage. And the whole painting can be analyzed that way. If you look at the directionality of the strokes and how they move you through the canvas and through the, through the surface. Remarkable painting. And again, back in the garden, lovely color. Um, you know, and, and this is where we get the crossover to somebody like Esteban Vincente. If you look at this painting on, on, the, on the right, yes, it's a vase with flowers and wall and tile and all that. But if you look at the color and you look at the kind of atmosphere that's being set up, by, by these, the interaction of the forms and color, you get that kind of abstract rhythm. In fact, there are many of, of uh, Soroya's paintings toward the end, which are very abstract in, in many ways. Um, I couldn't find, there's a painting of, of, a, of a cast reflection of a bridge in a stream that's really wonderful and very abstract and takes you a while to orient yourself. I couldn't find a good quality uh, photograph of it, but okay, and here we are. Um, looking at the play of form and color. And this is where the crossover, and this is where this really interesting show that they put together at the Parish Museum comes into play. And look, looking at the this kind of circular forms and 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 brushwork and directionality of the brushwork and how how if you look at this as an abstract painting as as the energy of the brushworks they're not that far apart these guys. Well, you know. Given, given that the subject matter is from the garden, you know, there's, there's that similarity, but, but really it's about paint handling in many ways and this uh, obsession with light and how do, how do you, how do you portray that? How do you, how do you give that quality, that, that shimmering, lively quality that you get from light? How do you put that in paint? And here again is, um, oh, wait a minute, let's go back. Um, here again, you know, the verticals and horizontals, the play of, of, of these kind of structural columns um, and, and large rectangular shapes and that, that kind of interaction and rhythm between the brushwork and the large, large areas. This is again, you know, there's a, there's a correlation between these guys. Okay, and now I'm gonna go back and step into Esteban Vincente and his development. Um, and, you know, basically, um, Vincente really um, developed through the 20th century and went with it. Um, you can see you know, basically, um, Vincente's training was as an, um, was in a very academic um, school in in Madrid, and he developed out of that. You know, in the in the early twenties, I, I believe he graduated from uh, the academy in twenty four, um, and 
he went to, you know, he went to Paris, he traveled, um, he met Picasso, he knew what was going on. And you can see how he developed stylistically in, in these pieces where, you know, 1923, there's a more conventional kind of impressionistic style landscape into this more Cezanne-esque still life into a, a little bit more um, uh, brushy um, Cezanne-esque style um, watercolor. And by 1950, he had kind of absorbed the cubist notions and was really working with collage and paint and different, very different approaches to what a painting could do. And here we are, he's in America. You know, he moved in 1937. Actually, I believe it might've been 1936 when he actually moved to America. He married in 36 and they moved to, they moved to New York. Um, and he was very quickly exposed to what was the avant-garde in America at that time. Um, and so there's a combination of painting and collage and things like that, that he's experimenting with. Um, very much part of the, the, um, the art scene at that time. And although I didn't include it, this painting, the growth painting on, on the left has, has really direct relations, you know, Joan Mitchell, um, uh, some of de Kooning's paintings actually look very similar to this or pre, um, pre the, the woman series that there, there were a bunch of, uh, still lives and, and landscape pieces that he did that had this kind of, um, broken form in it. Um, you can also see 1956, there was the, the, um, the avant-garde Rauschenberg and Johns had already started to impact. So there's a little, little touch of pop in there, but of course there, he comes from a tradition in, in, in Europe, Kurt Schwitters was, was doing, um, uh, collage back in the, the twenties, the teens actually. So, um, 1959, another collage, wonderful collage artist. I didn't include a lot of them because I'm trying to focus more on what gets to this mature style in the garden. And I got to keep moving along because we're getting, we're getting pretty, uh, far along. Um, these are the beginnings of this, this move to, the Hamptons and that that quality of light and the garden and that lush brushwork, um, minimal, complementary colors, just a play um, with that with that with those kind of veils of color, and you can see you know, this development in, in his work. Um, the rich, subtle color. Now, Vincente was also very successful. He started showing in America in, in the late thirties and, um, was pretty much um, accepted and collected from the, the inception when he first started doing his work. One of the things about Vincente is, and which distinguishes him in certain ways from many of the other abstract expressionists is these are not violent paintings. You know, many of the abstract expressionists, the slashing, the ripping, the tearing, you know, those violent attacks 
on 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 the body that that uh, de Kooning made uh, are missing here. You know, these are really, in many ways, very peaceful paintings. They're vibrant. They're they're lively, but they are also very. They have a harmonic rhythm in them. They are minimalist in color. Not a lot of colors used. He kind of really kept it in kind of traumatic um, balance. Um, complementary colors, yes, but but color dominance are something that he he played with. So you know, there's a lot of yellow in this painting with this with this purple slash through it, and the the warmth of that red against that that orangey yellow behind it. There's a link between these colors, okay? Um, he was also a very, very good teacher and taught in, in um, a number of different prestigious schools, Princeton, um, the New York uh, Studio School. He was very much he was very much there for a long period of time. He taught in Berkeley. Uh, I'm I'm forgetting three quarters of the places that he taught. He taught throughout his life and was very influential on a number of different students. Chuck Close studied with him. Um, um, uh, Dorothea Rockburn. Um, there's uh, again. I'm I'm. I'm losing I'm losing track of how many people, but there were many artists who studied with him and really loved Vincente. Um, okay, and here is here is a painting outside his studio window, uh, and here is his studio in his 18th century barn. Um, you can you can see you know there are these small windows that he's got that that are kind of the vantage point out into his garden and you know i really considered these two window views from that studio um not literally but but for him picking up the the radiance of that experience and trying to portray that in in his colors and with his forms that's that's kind of where he was and this this size 52 42 um was something he stuck in that range uh, a lot of his paintings i've looked at i've looked at you know a good 50 60 paintings and there's some proportion like that in, in the work. Lovely paintings. Um, I've seen a few. They, they have this veil-like quality that you get from somebody like Rothko. They have that kind of, of presence in them that although we're seeing them on the screen and they're lovely colors, you can't get the kind of depth and richness that you experience when you look at them in person. You know, there's there's drips, there's places where opaque paint is painted over transparent layers. There's things going on in these paintings that you can, nuances that you can only pick up when you see them. So if you get the chance to get out to the Parish Museum, probably a good trip. Okay, and I just threw in a few contemporaries, Frank and Thaler. There's a Rothko, one of his multi-form pieces, which I thought really, you know, in in many ways looks a lot like like things that that Vincente was up to. The Wolf Kahn piece. Um, you can see the relationship. I mean, uh, I, I had to throw in this Soroya uh, at the end here. This was actually Soroya's last painting. Soroya died uh, in 1923, but he had stroke in 1920. So this was one of his last paintings. 
quite a loss for us. I wish he'd lived uh, quite a few more years. The guy was 60 when he, when he passed. Um, uh, and then there's the Emily Mason. And I thought that was uh, these, these particular pieces related to Vincente and, and give you some kind of a context for, for that work that we were looking at. Okay. And we're back to one of the places that we started where we're doing a close up of, of, of one of Vincente's pieces next to Soroya. And the relationship between them, I think, is probably more apparent to you now after having looked at looked at the works. Um, there's a number of really good YouTubes on Soroya. Um, some of them are very academic. Some of them are really, really well done. Um, I think the Soraya Master of uh, Spanish Master of Light is a good one. That's from the uh, National Gallery, but there are a number of them that are that are really terrific. Um, and then Harriet and Esteban Vincente Foundation has a um, I, I put in this content thing where basically uh, that gets you to a number of um, uh, videos that are interviews with, with Vincente, and there's a biography on there of Vincente that um, show you more of his work and show you his work in relationship to the garden. They're terrific and worth a visit. So that about wraps it up. I hope you enjoyed our, 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 our visit with these sunny Spanish folks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Larry, the bit one of the best parts is your enthusiasm. As you get to some of them and you do the brush stroke and the this. I just love it. I hope you all are enjoying it as much as I am. Larry, your explanation for everything is just superb. So uh, thank, you. thank you so much and thank you all for coming. And um I hope we'll see you again in a few uh, we'll see you in two we weeks. We have a lot of programs. Maybe on we have Monday. somebody Somebody put something in there exactly. Yeah, she just you answered old the question. Is and speech. Ah, yeah. Vincente died in 2001. He was 97 about two weeks before his 98th birthday. So there's Real. something to living a happy life. <laughs> <laughs> Are you trying to say Soraya didn't? <laughs> he died in 60. Yeah. So you don't know. All right. Yep. So. Thank you all, and I uh, hope to see you again soon. Yes. Bye, everyone. Bye.